Josh Eddick filling in for Mike Gill here on 97.3 ESPN alongside Hunter Brody here in the Matt Black Kia Studios on 97.3 ESPN. Broads, yes, it is the day before Christmas. We get the folks for an hour and a half today. You excited? Absolutely. Look, we get to break down some Sixers action basketball, Josh. We get some hoops. Of course I am excited. I mean, it feels like basketball belongs with Christmas at this point, right? Yeah, unfortunately, we don't get to see our own squad in the mix, which is weird. It seems like we have been accustomed to that, and it got stripped away from us. Of course, you know, we'll talk about the Sixers game for last night. A win that was in some ways surprising. Of course, let's not forget about the fact that Let's be realistic. The starters didn't play well, Broads. They did not play well at all. It was the bench that had to come in and save this team. There was ugly, ugly basketball being played, specifically that third quarter. And and towards the end of that half, look, they scored 30 points in the first quarter, and I saw things that I liked. And then Berton started getting hot from deep. And I jokingly put out there on Twitter, I thought guys like Bertons only get hot against coaches like Brett Brown. I guess this is news to me. Oh, my goodness. I it, It's one of those things I'm watching that game last night. And the, the, I, all I kept thinking was, I don't know how Doc can keep this starting lineup, but they're going to play like this, right? Like, that was my first reaction. Yeah, Danny Green, I, I mean, look, it's, it's one game, so it's so hard to put a lot of stock into it. Are these players going to find their groove and get more comfortable with the other players in the starting rotation? Sure, I absolutely think so. But Danny Green being minus 27 in 18 minutes is really atrocious. Him and Seth Curry combined one for nine. And do we dare even get into what Tobias Harris did last night? Because there were times he literally threw the basketball underneath the basket and hit the bottom of the rim and flew back towards him. It was a move and a shot that I would see at the local park. And I look over to whoever's playing with me going, who invited that guy? I mean, there were some bad shots from Toby, bricking wide open threes as well. So three of your five starters, I thought, had a a tough day at the office. I mean, at least Seth woke up later in the game and gave you a little something. But the way that Shake Milton and Tyrese Maxey and Dwight Howard stepped up off the bench was impressive. And then Doc, I love the fact the last night that Doc said, This isn't working. We're going to do something different. In the beginning of the fourth quarter, it was Joel Embiid and the shooters lineup. Yeah, and Shake Milton, too, by the way. If you noticed, Ben Simmons wasn't carrying the basketball up late in the game in the fourth quarter. You had Shake Milton running your entire offense down the stretch, which is something that definitely stood out to me. Now, we always question during those moments, what can Ben Simmons do? Can he stay in the dunker spot? Will that work? You saw a very great play executed where Joel B was at the top of the three-point line-ish. Ben Simmons was in that dunker spot, and the, and the Wizards' defense had to make a decision. They bought going to Embiid. A nice bounce pass over to Ben Simmons down low, and he slammed it in. So you saw it work, is my point. You did see those two being out there with Ben off the ball working in a crucial play. Yeah, absolutely. And let's not forget about the fact that last night, you you mentioned Bertans. He was on fire when he was in there. Russell Westbrook had a triple-double. And I have to wonder how much of that game last night was the Sixers winning versus the Wizards losing because for the majority of the game, aside from three stretches, the Wizards owned the game. There was a stretch early in the first half when there was all the bench in there and they got them back the lead. There was a stretch in the fourth quarter where they started to assert themselves, and then there was the end of the game. Otherwise, the rest of the game was the Wizards. I'll throw this back your way, though, because even on the broadcast, Mark Zumoff, a la, they were speaking about it. It was almost like they were having a hard time giving the Wizards defense credit, and they were more disappointed in the Sixers offense and how they were running. So how much of it was the Wizards were really playing this stellar defense compared to the half-court sets for the Sixers' offense was that putrid, and it was them just specifically, individually playing poor. Not so much the Wizards forcing them to play poor, if that makes sense. I would say it's half and half, because I thought the Wizards actually did do a good job at what I would call assignment basketball, saying, I got my man, I'm not going to let him just take open shots. But then other times, the Sixers had open shots, and they were running an offense, and they couldn't hit the shot. And... To me, it was kind of a little bit of both because when I look at the Sixers, 
it seemed like there were moments in the game where you were like, this is what I expected. And there are other moments of the game where you thought, is this even an NBA basketball team? And I, I do think that because it's game one, that's one of the reasons why you got that. And and I'm looking at what happened late, right? So Joel Embiid kept getting the basketball. You mentioned having spacing around him and having a bunch of shooters, which allowed him to operate more in his wheelhouse. You saw, though, because he was constantly getting buckets. And I have been raising the question, can you survive with Joel Embiid late going back and forth with an opponent and him constantly getting you buckets? At some point, I feel... You're going to need other guys to step up. Now, there was a moment in time where he was a little bit more tired, and and you can notice that he was more tired. Seth Curry ended up hitting that one-footed jumper, that one-footed runner. You had Ben Simmons come up with the shot. You had Shake Milton go into the basket. So other guys helped out, but you needed that to happen. And I just wonder what would happen in other games in the future if, you don't have one of those three players stepping up because I don't think Joel Embiid could do it all. He is going to need help. No, it was obvious last night that Joel can have moments and stretches, but I just don't think that he, as currently constructed, can do that consistently. Like It shouldn't take until the fourth quarter for you to score all that he did. For someone as talented and as big as he is, he should be able to dominate from beginning to end not just in the fourth quarter when you happen to have spacing. Like, I feel like his talent is much more, Hunter, than just, I can play for this many minutes, great. Like, I feel like you shouldn't be a microwave, you should be a dominant player. Well, maybe he's getting used to the minutes as well, because you saw, first off, they can go with a full defensive five, or excuse me, a full a bench rotation of five guys, which is not something we really saw out of Brett Brown, which then ultimately allowed Joel Embiid to play the full fourth quarter. We've been so used to, okay, six minutes into the game, Embiid's checking out. We got this flow of how he was used throughout the, the Brett Brown era. Well, maybe he's getting used to having to play a full fourth quarter and, and getting used to how he's being used with the minute side of things. He's Hunter Brody. I'm Josh Henning filling in for Mike Gill here on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN. The PlaySugarHouse.com text board is open at 609-403-0973. Still to come on the show, we got Paul Hudrick, our Sixers insider for 97.3 ESPN.com. He was in the house last night. We'll talk with him more about the Sixers as well as at the top of the 3 o'clock hour, KC joined the football scientist, Eagles Cowboys this Sunday. You hear all the action right here. On 97.3 ESPN, coverage begins at 3 p.m. for the or Philadelphia Eagles. And we'll also get into the NFL slate because you got one game on Christmas, three games on Christmas, the day after Christmas, and then the Sunday slate, and then Monday. So you have four days of NFL action merged with the start of the NBA season this week on top of college bowl season. It's euphoric right now with sports. And I'm not complaining one bit. This is beautiful. It really is. The fact that I can go on my ESPN app and check out the schedule for all these sports and I see a handful of games for all of these events, I'm, I'm super excited. Plus, Josh, you know what? The Fly Guys, the R's in the black, they're coming soon. Just a few weeks away, right? It's the 13th, right? The 13th, and they start the season out playing Pittsburgh twice. The way it worked out when they dropped the schedule. By the way, people like, we can see the full schedule at 97.3 ESPN.com. Thanks to Kevin Durso. Yes, they can. But the way it breaks down, essentially, is you're playing two games. It's almost like a two-game series when you play these squads. So you'll play the Penguins two times in a row. You'll play Buffalo two times in a row. You'll play the next opponent two times in a row, which it can lead to some bad blood. What if there's a chippy game happening in the first game against the Penguins, and then a night later you got to see them again? I don't like the schedule, to be honest with you. Why? I don't like it. I don't like the back-to-backs. I I think that there should have been a way they could have mixed it up a little bit. I think there's seven back-to-backs in the 56 games. I think there's more than that. I felt like almost every week there was a back-to-back. 
No, I think it finished out with seven or eight total back-to-backs. They normally have, like, a game separated. So they play, like, the Penguins on the 13th, and then they play the Penguins again on the 15th. But there are back-to-backs involved throughout. Uh, But that's what you kind of have to do. They want to get the season. I feel the NHL is trying to get their schedule back on track in terms of what it used to be. Oh, I know that's what they're trying to do. I'm just not a fan of this. We'll play Pittsburgh two games, and the Rangers for two games, and the Islanders for two games, and the Bruins for two games. It's just like... You're telling me you couldn't have played the Rangers and the Islanders and then the Rangers? Like, you couldn't have mixed it up somehow? Like, a lot of these teams are playing. They're all in the same area. The Devils, the Rangers. Uh, oh, it's the, because you're limiting travel. So you can just play. Right, Instead of but, having to go play all the teams, you go one place, you play them twice, you go to the next place, you play them twice. Yeah, but you're telling me you can't go to Newark one day, then the next game you go to the Rangers, the next game you go to the Islanders, and then you reverse it back in order. I think you're nitpicking, Josh. I am Be nitpicking. Happy to have hockey back. You know what? You, I, I, I'll nitpick a little bit, uh, and this ties back to the Sixers to get us back on track here with with the basketball squad. I get wow the ho- the, the hockey the hockey guy doesn't like this the side trail into the hockey. Well, I like it, but we gotta we gotta talk business. As excited as I am for Claude Giroux and Carter Hart, I'm excited too to watch a little hoops. And last night, I get ripped all the time because I value plus minus. Now, I only value plus minus when it's to an extreme, when something stands out because that's telling me something. I like where you're going with this. Shake Milton was plus thirty three in the first half alone. The 76ers bench was almost double the plus minus of the starters in the first half. How insane is that? It definitely tells me that they got a lot of work to do. You know, that that half court set when it came to the starting rotation, you saw a lot of hiccups. You saw a lot of issues. You saw poor, poor play. And I, I will say it reminded me of what we saw last year at times with that half court set. So, you know, it's on Doc Rivers to find a way because at the end of the day, good teams do this. Good teams find ways to squeak one out, but they definitely squeak one out. They got to get back in the lab, as they say, and work on what they're going to do in, in half court offense when the game slows down because it was putrid. Yeah, and, and I don't understand how you go through a game. And I'm just saying in the first half. You're in the first half of a game last night. Tobias Harris has three fouls, two turnovers, and one rebound. What? He started out the game hot, too. He made, like, his first couple of buckets, looked aggressive. And then from there, specifically the fourth quarter, how many open looks? I have a stretch here where I noted this entire run down because I thought this could have been the difference. If they lost, I would have went back to this moment. There was about three to four minutes left in the basketball game. Ben Simmons had a huge block. Tobias missed a wide-open three. Then Shake Milton missed two free throws. Tobias gets the rebound right under the bucket, misses the putback. Bradley Beal hits a three on the other end, and the next possession, Tobias missed a wide-open three. That all happened down the stretch, and it's unacceptable from a guy you're paying that much money. It, to me, it's more than just the money, though. To me, the problem is, is that you know we always talk about you, me, Gil, and others about how, you know, at some point, the players got to do their job, right? At some point, the players got to step up. And at the end of that game, when I'm looking over at this team, because, you know, my philosophy is I don't look at stats till after the game. I want to get my eyeballs to tell me one thing, and then I'll check out what the numbers say. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't realize it was this bad. The starting lineup, the starting five of your Philadelphia 76ers had 11 turnovers themselves last night. Do you know what the bench total turnovers was last night? What was that? Five. Wow. Yeah, that, that's a problem for that's sure. That's embarrassing. Usually it's the opposite. Usually the starters are the ones that have it together and the bench is a little sloppy. Or No, the bench was a better unit than the starters. And it wasn't just Shake Milton, who was incredible last night, defensively and offensively. It was Dwight Howard, who went in there with a little level of ferocity out there. You had Mike Scott looking like he was ready to uh, you know, maybe go throw down if he had to after that shove on Ben Simmons, the hack by Bertons. Everyone wanted to fight Bertons, Tobias and everybody else. But Mike Scott, look at his face like, let's go, boy. 
Yeah, and that's what Mike Scott brings to the table. Now, you mentioned Dwight Howard. In 13 minutes, he casually grabs 10 rebounds. Right. <laughs> and he, and he, just, he shows the, the veteran presence that you need. And how about after the game? Now, I'm not going to dive into this and say that this is now Ben Simmons going to be some great shooter because after the game, he worked on his shots with Dwight Howard. But I think this just adds such a, a big layer to – Look, Ben and Joel have been the top guys in the organization over the last handful of years. They never had this veteran presence to Dwight Howard's level. I can't believe that sentence just came out of my mouth, but that's who he is now. Dwight Howard is this respected guy. This is the little things that you you add when you get a presence like Dwight Howard. That yep. big picture can be the difference in how those two grow and groom as NBA professionals. Dwight is cultivating a culture with this team that there wasn't there before. You know, remember Brett Brown talked about the culture of the team, the spirit of the team. Well, obviously the culture and the spirit was broken because Dwight Howard's coming in here and he's taking ownership of this locker room. And people forget, Dwight's got the resume to do it. He's a defensive player of the year, a multiple-time All-Star, led the league in rebounds. He's been to the NBA Finals, and let's not forget, he was with a, an NBA Finals team that literally was nobody. Like, it was him, it was Hidu Turkoglu, and a bunch of nobodies. And yet, they had to go head-to-head with Kobe, Pau Gasol, and the Lakers. So, if anybody understands what it takes to get to the championship level, it's got to be Dwight Howard. You didn't think that squad could get it done, that Orlando team. Oh, I had no faith in them to win that finals, <laughs> but I was impressed they got there. I was impressed that Dwight literally dragged a bunch of, you know, in the Christmas analogy, misfit toys from the island and brought them to the finals and brought them right up to the line and said, we're going to go head to head with Kobe. I want to get your thoughts on this, though, Josh. Yesterday, Ben Simmons finished with this stat line. 16 points, 9 rebounds, 7 assists, 2 steals, 3 blocks, 2 of 6 from the free throw line. Definitely want to see the free throw line improve and the free throws from the charity stripe get going. The first shot of the game for him was a decently, it, it was a decent jump shot. All right, it didn't go in, but I thought it was a reasonable jump shot to leave me intrigued. And then later on the game, he gave you some sort of a runner-looking shot going the other way. Do you put any stock into that? That the first shot of the game for him was a jump shot, as if he wanted to make a statement right out of the gate. I mean, I liked seeing it, but I'm more concerned about the free throws. Because to me, if he makes his free throws... That's a huge deal. If he can go 5 for 7 every night or 6 for 8 or 10 for 12, that's a huge upgrade for that guy because at the end of the day, you can take all the jump shots you want and miss them because someone might have their hand in your face. But if you're making the or making the freebies, that's a big deal. And I, I'm not a big guy to sit here and say, this stat. But uh, when you tell me he went 2 for 6 for the free throws, Oh, that 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 makes me nervous. That makes me uncomfortable, honestly. I agree with you. I think that is the number one thing that we should all be dissecting more than the jumper. Although I understand why the jumper is more discussed because you know it it is the jump shot, and you and you see that in a different form when it comes to how teams defend you. But at the free throw line, he needs to work on that because that makes you go from a 16-point-per-game guy to a 19-point-per-game guy or a 16 to a 20. And and later, you would see him attack because he would feel more confident. I feel that there's times where he can easily go to the bucket, but he's unwilling to because he's not as comfortable going to the charity stripe as he should be. And that could be the difference in getting a big bucket late. That could be the difference in going up and, and grabbing two points down the stretch so you don't have to go back to Joel Embiid and have him go in the post down low and operate for another straight possession. But I, I do want to talk about Ben specifically in some of these sets that they ran, and they've done this before in years past. I don't like Ben Simmons in this traditional post-up game. I don't think that it's very smooth, and I don't think that's the best way to utilize his skill set. I think he can use that 6'10 body frame to his advantage, backing guys down, but then you can square up and face up. That's how he needs to work. Back up, then face up. But if you're just going to back up the whole time, I think that really limits some offensive possessions. 
I don't like the fact that there were multiple times last night that it looked like Ben was not interested in having the ball. Did you notice that? It didn't stand out to me, but maybe that's because that's who Ben Simmons is at this point. There's plenty of times where he goes through a quarter or so where he's not being the downhill aggressive guy. There were moments that stood out to me. For example, when he, I I didn't really get crossed up. He tripped over someone's foot on the screen. But when Russell Westbrook hit that shot and did the celebration, he went into attack mode a couple times. And there's a clear difference when he does that compared to when he's not. But I wouldn't say it truly stood out as if ah Ben wasn't interested. But maybe that's because I'm just used to that at this point. Maybe, maybe you are. I just felt like there were multiple times watching the game that it felt like Ben was like just not interested for stretches of time and in being involved in the offense, and that bothers me because you know, and maybe part of it bothers me because instead of being used to it, I'm expecting him to give me something, right? I'm expecting him to do something. And there were times in the game that he just disappeared, and I'm not thrilled about that. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to sit here and pound the table here, say, we got to trade Ben Simmons for James Harden, especially when James Harden can't get his own life in check. So I feel like if, if Dwight Howard bringing Ben onto the court every night after a game Maybe that's the key. Maybe someone has to hold Ben accountable after the game, not just during or pregame. Maybe it's Ben saying to to Ben, I mean, uh, Dwight saying to Ben, hey, we need to go work. Let's go put in some work. Come on. Matisse, you want to come too? Fine, let's go. Love that you just mentioned that because I was going to go in that direction. Now, he also had Matisse out there. He only played, he got checked in for the first time with 40 seconds left to go in the game. I'm not surprised. To me, it looks like Tyrese Maxey took his minutes for now. I don't know what Tyrese Maxey can grow into. Maybe it's even a bigger role than where he is at this moment. Awesome first half. Second half, not as great. It seemed like the speed of the game caught up to him a bit, and he was a little overwhelmed. But Matisse Thibel, he's he's supposed to be a 3 and D guy. Well, right now, he's just a D guy, and I don't know if that's enough to log a ton of minutes. So he was out there as well. And and maybe he's looking at it as last year I played and I played a lot this year. I can barely get on the floor. I got to do something about it. So we'll, we'll see how that really goes for him. But I thought it was noticeable that he was out there as well. I purposely wanted to bring up the James Harden thing because I don't think we can go through the rest of the show without mentioning this James Harden mess. Uh, I said on Twitter last night, it's disgusting to me. It's, it's absolutely a sign of disrespect and disregard for everybody, the way Harden's going about things. I don't understand how people think that what he's doing is excusable or okay. This drama with him, he won't take responsibility for his actions. Why is he the only guy who's blatantly violating protocols? Why is he the only guy who has a problem with the league protocols. He's saying, nobody understands me. Everyone's trying to make me the bad guy. And this is the guy that people want to trade Ben Simmons for? Well, I think he's only doing this because he wants out so bad. I'm not saying that that's a a reason to do it, but I'm saying I don't think he acts this way in another organization if he's happy with where he's at. I think he's purely doing this because he wants out and he's forcing his hand. But, but Once again, I'm not claiming that that makes this any better or that would make me want him any differently. I'm just trying to look at it from, okay, why is he doing this? Probably because he wants the Rockets to be so upset with him that they have to deal him elsewhere. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not on board with that because irresponsible always act up in, irresponsible people always act up in difficult situations. The old saying is pressure causes pipes to burst, all right? This is, I think, who Harden really is deep down. You go and read that ESPN article about all the stuff that he does. This is not something new for him. It's just that he's doing it more blatantly right now because he's unhappy about the situation. Chucking the ball at teammates at practice. He's supposed to be a laid-back guy. And now he's acting out over and over. I'm sorry, I, I can't confirm that just because... He goes to the Sixers or the Nets or another team means he's just going to suddenly change. This is not like a, a dating relationship where the person's saying, well, if they dated me, they would be better. I'm going to fix this person. You're not here to fix people. You're here to win basketball games. Well, to be fair, he wasn't doing it to this level until this recent stretch. So I I, I don't know. I mean, he absolutely he was fine prior well, we didn't hear about it. Like he said, like they said in the ESPN article, he was doing all kinds of things, and it just never became public. 
Yeah, but that's every NBA player with uh, or professional athletes in general. They all do things. It just some become more public than others. Yeah, but and like- now because this is a conversation, it's getting out more. But like just to play a little devil's advocate, mm-hmm. you know, these these guys they they do this kind of stuff and some guys get caught doing it, some guys don't, but there's probably plenty of guys that you would never imagine that are doing very similar stuff that uh James Harden's doing. There are, but I'm just saying that I just I think it's a little ridiculous that re- the Harden refused to take any responsibility for his actions and there's a contingent of Sixer fans who think, "Oh, well, Harden is going to be so different when he comes here." And I think that's fair. I'm with you. I understand where you're coming from. I'm just playing the other side a little bit. I, I do think that he, I don't think he'd be doing the same thing that he's doing right now, wherever he goes next, wherever he goes, if he's happy, if he goes to Brooklyn, Philadelphia, do I think he would operate the same way he's operating right now to force his hand out of Houston? No, I don't. But deep down, is he the same person that made these moves? Yes, absolutely he is. And if, if things go sour wherever he goes next, you know that this could be incoming. He's Hunter Brody. I'm Josh Hennig, filling in for Mike Gill on the Sports Bash on 97.3. Happy Christmas Eve, everyone. The Sports Bash being brought to you by Recovery Centers of America, Drug and Alcohol Addiction Treatment Centers located in Mays Landing and Devon, PA. Paul Hudrick, our 76ers insider, will join us coming up next here on 97.3 ESPN FM and the 97.3 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Seattle City. Happy holidays to all of our listeners. Ho, ho, ho. I downloaded the app. Now I take my favorite station all over the world. Merry Christmas. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. From 97.3 ESPN. Josh Hedick filling in for Mike Gill along with Hunter Brody here on 97.3 ESPN. Happy Christmas Eve to everyone out there being safe out there. Also, if you got to see the Sixers last night, Sixers eke out with a win last night in uh, a very interesting game as it played out. And to get more into the game as we saw it last night is our 76ers insider, Paul Hudrick. You can follow him on Twitter at Paul Hudrick. And you can check out his latest article at 97.3ESB.com with his takeaways. He was in the house for the game last night. Paul, how are you doing today? I'm great, Josh. How are you, man? Doing pretty good. So I'm going to start off with you where I kind of started off with the beginning of the show, which is I, I'm, I'm conflicted because I'm not sure. Did the Sixers really win that game last night <laughs> or did Washington lose that game last night? I'm going to say the Sixers won that game. Um, cause, I mean, I'll, I'll start with this. If you expected them to – it's like you expected Doc Rivers to just have a magic wand and make everything work with two preseason games, one where Joel Embiid didn't even play, and, and in a shortened training camp where he had two guys that are rotation players, you know, start training camp with COVID, with Danny Green less than two months removed from a championship. Like, if you if you expected this thing to just hum from the beginning – like you are, I don't know. Either you're a really big optimist, or you just you just didn't read the situation well. Like it was, it was going to be ugly to start, and it was. Um, at, at least from the starters' perspective, the bench came in and and provided a nice little spark. And I think that speaks to more of more of those guys playing together, right? When you look at Shake Milton, when you look at Furkan Korkmaz, Mike Scott, like those guys have played together before. So I think that's part of it. Um, but yeah, I, I would say if you know. I'll, I'm encouraged by the fourth quarter because I think the, the third quarter was some of the worst offensive basketball I've ever watched in that building. Um, and I've watched some bad offensive basketball in that building, but the fourth quarter was just so impressive the way Joel and B took it over. Even Ben Simmons defensively, the way he took over down the stretch. Um, I, I'm more encouraged again than I am discouraged by what I saw because I thought they did what they had to do in the fourth quarter to come away with a win. And, and again, it looked like it was getting away from them. You mentioned that third quarter. They scored 15 total points. They didn't get their first bucket until halfway through. They had 10 straight misses. So what went wrong? What what was the problem in those half-court sets? They just looked completely lost. It looked like the offense looked like, hey, get the ball to Joel and beat in the post. And then, you know, and then, and then they didn't really seem like they had a plan after that. Uh, it, looked like a lot, it looked like a lot of standing around, which is something that Doc Rivers is not a fan of. Doc Rivers really encourages – movement in his offense, you know, moving the ball moving and then also players moving off of it. So you didn't see a lot of that with Joel Embiid. I thought it, it just got like really stagnant 
And on top of that, when they got good looks, they just flat out missed them. Um, you know, everybody did uh, in that stretch, whether it was Tobias Harris, whether it was Danny Green, even Seth Curry. Like, they just – they could – on top of just having – of a bad offense, of a stagnant offense, they just couldn't make a shot. So I think it was it was just a, a bad combination of things. And it's again uh, to me, this was expected. I I expected it to be clunky. I expected it to be kind of ugly from the start. Um, and if anything, I'm just really encouraged by the bench because of how great they look. Um, but yeah, the starters they got some serious work to do. They got to figure a lot of things out. You mentioned the bench, and that's where I really wanted to go next. And that is, you know, you have a starting unit that had 11 turnovers. The bench had. Five. You had a starting unit that had 16 fouls. The bench had nine. It just felt like the starters had no life at times, but the bench came in firing between Dwight Howard and Maxi and Milton and Mike Scott's energy. It felt like the bench was like, we're ready to go, and the starters didn't know what they were doing at times. Yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's a number of things, I think. It's... Um, uh, you know, Danny Green, I think it's very clear he still doesn't have his legs back. You know, and, and it is a tricky situation he was in where, you know, he comes off the championship with the Lakers. Then two months later, you know, when he, he gets traded here, he, the trade isn't completed. He misses the beginning of camp. So he just has a lot of things working against him right now. I don't, I expect him to be better. I expect him to get his legs out from under him. I think that was a big part of the issue. Um, uh, Tobias Harris is just, uh, he looks lost out there. I, I, that's, that is my biggest concern. With the starting lineup, it's just that Tobias Harris just looks like he is in like a confidence crisis right now, and he is really struggling. And I'm, you know, you, you got to really hope that Doc Rivers can get through to him into making those quicker decisions and not be so hesitant. And then Seth Curry, I actually thought I thought he struggled early, but I think you started to see him find his footing in the fourth quarter. You know, he started running s- some of those dribble handoffs with Joel Embiid. That's that's the the, the play out of the timeout that that was basically the, the ceiling basket where he found Ben Simmons wide wide open for. A, so I just think it's. The starters just have, and we're in, when we're talking about the bench, Shake Milton is just is the opposite of Tobias Harris right now. He is the most confident basketball player around right now. It's ridiculous. The level he is playing at is, and I'm a Shake Milton guy, and you can ask anyone that knows me. I've been a Shake Milton guy from day one, but even I am kind of blown away by how good he was last night, how good he's been leading up to this, and especially like, you know defensively how good he was last night. And then um, I loved what I saw from Dwight Howard, man. I mean, he's he's really active. He had 10 rebounds, a bunch of offensive rebounds. Screen setting wise, I mean, I I don't know that they've had a better screen setter here in a really long time. And I think that's what when you talk about what makes Maxi so good is he's so good at, at at dribbling and playing off of ball screens. So when you have a guy like Dwight who's so good at setting them and rolls so hard to the rim, and then a guy like Maxi who can finish, it's just a really good combination. And then Quirkmaz and Mike Scott. They just got to keep hitting open shots. I mean, that's that's all you can really ask of those two guys is is when they're when they're found, they got to hit them. And they're just those guys are in a really good groove right now. They look really good, and I, I think it's I think it's the individual parts are all very good. Whereas with the starters, uh, Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons, I felt looked great. Seth Seth Curry looked good in the fourth quarter, but the other two guys right now, I mean, they got they got a lot of work to do uh, to get right. They absolutely do, and I always get made fun of because I I like to value plus minus when it's warranted, and Shake Milton was plus 33 last night, so that (laughs) clearly stood out to me, while Danny Green was minus 27 in 18 minutes. But I do want to touch on Joel Embiid late because in the fourth quarter, they scored 40 points as a team, and he was clearly getting buckets after buckets after buckets when needed. But there was a moment with a handful of minutes left where you could tell He was a little bit defeated. He was a little bit tired. And luckily, Milton had a bucket. Seth Curry had that one-footed shot that went in. Simmons got a bucket. Essentially, Joel Embiid needed some help. And I just question, is he going to be able to get that help every night? Is what he did sustainable? Because I worry that he's going to get beat up. He is going to get tired. And he's going to need help in some of those moments. Yeah, and that's the bottom line. Is these other guys need to step up because because Joel Embiid was he was dominant in that fourth quarter. I really like that lineup that Doc Rivers rolled out was just surrounding him with four shooters. I think that helped him a lot. I think it helped open up some space. Uh, and again, I, I I what I really was encouraged by was how Seth Curry stepped up in the fourth quarter and how he looked playing off of Joel Embiid. To your point, how they really complemented each other, I thought was huge. And Seth had a couple big floaters in the paint. Like I said, he found Ben Simmons on that. Uh, after timeout play, I mean, it, so I, I think it's just a matter of 
those guys getting more comfortable, you know, Seth Curry getting more comfortable again, Danny Green getting his getting his legs together. And the, the biggest, it's funny because it's the biggest question mark on the entire roster for me is Tobias Harris. Uh, what is he going to be this year? Um, he can't be that guy that, that we saw in, in that first game. He can't. He just can't. I mean, he had a chance in the fourth quarter, two wide open corner threes, and missed them both. Would have been huge shots, either one of them. And yeah, so I mean, that's my biggest concern. The other cast members, I think, are going to be okay. I think Shake Milton is is proving that he can help, especially from a scoring standpoint. He can help shoulder that low with Joel Embiid. I think Ben Simmons is going to get more comfortable. You saw him after the game working out with Dwight Howard, trying to get more shots up and get more comfortable in that role. And, and again, Seth Curry, I expect to just keep getting better and better. So I, I think there is enough help uh, around him once everybody's right. But, again, to, I'll just keep pressing on that. I think Tobias Harris is my biggest concern right now. Paul Hudrick joining us here on the Boardwalk on the Hotline on 97.3 ESPN, our 76ers insider. Check out his latest takeaways from the game last night over at 97.3 ESPN.com and the free 97.3 ESPN mobile app at Paul Hudrick on Twitter. Paul, you mentioned Dwight Howard a little bit earlier, and I want to touch on him with you. I love what he did in the game last night, but I also love what he did after the game when he brought Ben and Matisse onto the court after the game to get some shots up, get some work in, and it seems like Dwight is intent on changing the environment and the culture on this team. And I think it's interesting because this is the guy that most people would never have thought of would be that guy. But when you really start, start thinking about it, he's got the resume to be the leader. Defensive player of the year, multiple-time All-Star, led a band of misfit toys to the NBA Finals with the Magic to over 10 years ago. It seems like this guy has really embraced the veteran role, and these guys seem like they're actually willing to listen to him. Yeah, uh, it's, and this, you know, uh, you saw, like you mentioned, I mean, Dwight Howard, the resume speaks for itself. I mean, he was the, the best center, the best big man in the NBA for, for a long stretch there. And I, I with that, I, I think he had an ego, and I, you can understand why, because he was great. Uh, you know, again, the defensive player of the year guy, an all-NBA guy, he was a great player. And, you know, as his skills have kind of, you know, he still has skills, but, you know, as with anybody, the skills diminish a little bit. And at first he was really reluctant to see, it seemed at least that he was reluctant to take that complimentary role and be that guy. And he, you know, was on like, you know, whatever, I think 60s, you know, 16s and six years or something like that. So all of that, I, I think, you know, when you look at the course of his career, from the first time that we spoke to him in Philly, you know, to hear him talk and to hear him talk so glowingly about Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons and what he wants to do for them and how he wants to help them. And it's like the perspective that he has gained is unbelievable to me um, as, you know, a, a, the guy who's been in the league forever. Um, it, it's the, the fact that he's just so willing and wants to impart this wisdom. And, you know, you, you hear the first press conference, you're like, okay, like this is, he's saying all the right things. It's the first presser. Like this, this is really great. But he has continued to be like that all along. And then you see a thing last night, like last night with Ben Simmons and Matisse Thibel, and he's walking the walk. Uh, he, not only is he saying all the right things, but he's doing the right things. And you hear Doc Rivers, you hear his teammates, you know, effusive in their praise for his leadership and the energy he brings. And uh, it's it's looking like that's going to be, you know, Daryl Morey has done a lot of good things, and that's looking like one of his better moves this offseason for sure. I have a question on Ben Simmons when it comes to him backing down and posting up. What are your thoughts on how he's utilized sometimes in, in terms of the post up? Because I like when he uses his size to his advantage at 6'10", but I like when he posts up and then he, he faces up by the end because that's what he does so well. Sometimes I feel in this offense, and we've, we've seen him do that before when it was with Brett Brown, I just don't know if I love all of the posts up that he gets. I'm with you. I don't necessarily love it either. It's not proven to be a super efficient look for them in the past when they, when Brett Brown was here. I think, I don't know off the top of my head, but I, I think like from like an advanced analytics percentile perspective, Ben Simmons has not been a great post scorer and has not been in the possessions generally haven't gone that well for the Sixers when he does post up. And I agree. I, I like a much better facing the basket. Like Doc Rivers has said, going downhill. The one look I've always liked, and it's something that Brett Brown really tried really hard to, to, to really um, to, to, to institute here. And it, it's had mixed results, but you saw it more last night. And again, a little more, 
more Rick mixed results, but you can see where it would work is that kind of snug pick and roll look, which is basically in the low post, Ben Simmons and, and Joel, Joel Embiid running a pick and roll. And it's a tough look to cover because then you're asking, you know, a big man to kind of, you know, show on Ben Simmons at the rim, um, which is not an easy matchup for a big man. You can kind of, you know, maybe blow around them and, and, and get an easy layup. Or you get a switch on a Joel Embiid with a smaller player, you post him up, and you get a good look. So um, I don't love the post-ups. I, I don't think that's a great look for the Sixers. I don't think that's the best way to use Ben Simmons. But I would like to see him more, and like I said, in those, in those snug pick-and-roll actions I like with Embiid. And even in general, I would just like to see him, you know, get more ball screens. And I think that's something that they – I know he's not, a, you know, he, he's not the most willing shooter, so that's not always – you know, teams are going to play under it a little bit. But I still think you can make it work um, in, in certain instances. And I, I would like to see him – play more fish in the basket as opposed to posting up. Paul, uh, speaking of what Ben did, I want to know how much of what we saw from the team last night with the starters offensive, whether it's Ben with the post-ups, whether it was how they were, we're not up oh, and the, uh, well, we'll get Paul back in just a moment there, Hunter. We uh, were just having a conversation with him, but his phone decided to drop on us. I did hear that. I heard him drop right off. So, uh, so here's where we're at. Yeah, we'll get we'll get Paul back in a moment, but go ahead. Yeah, definitely. No, I, I was I was going to follow up with a little bit of what he was talking about with Ben Simmons. I just I look at what he can do so well, and I look at his skill set, which is very unique. And I just don't know how you how you watch him play and go. I'm going to keep posting this guy up. Like I get it, he's six ten, and you can use that size advantage, but he's so much better in other ways. Yeah, no, I, I hear you 100%. We got Paul back now. Uh, so, Paul, what, what I was trying to ask you before your, your technology decided to hate us here on Christmas Eve, <laughs> not very Christmas-like of the technology, but I want to know how much of what we saw last night from Ben and Joel and all these guys was a byproduct of who was on the floor and how could that impact what Doc Rivers does down the road? Because I still have this feeling, not that I have any other real evidence of this, but I still have this feeling that this might not be the starting lineup forever for this season. I de- definitely. I mean, I, look, I, you watched that game last night, and Shake Milton was unequivocally the third best player for the Sixers. I mean, he may, you could maybe even make an argument he was the second best player uh, at certain points. I would say third just because of how good Ben Simmons was defensively down the stretch. But uh, in any case, I mean, there's certainly an argument to be made that Shake Milton would look good in that starting unit as like a secondary ball handler for Simmons. And, you know, again, get more of that offense with when Joel Embiid maybe is getting double teamed hard or maybe doesn't have it, whatever. Uh, But then you could also make the argument that we've seen how Doc Rivers has utilized really good bench guards in the past, like a Lou Williams or Jamal Crawford, and maybe Shake Milton fits into that role. I mean, look at what the Clippers do now. I mean, Nicholas Batum starts, but you're going to like, clearly Lou Williams is the better player and it's clearly going to have the bigger role for them it's just the way it goes because he's coming off the bench so it's i i do think certainly nothing set in set in stone i mean this is one of of 72 games so doc rivers is going to have options he's going to have time to think about it i think what's good is that shake milton is pushing you to think that because playing so well the fact that that this is on our brains that we're that everyone's already kind of overreacting the one game and saying yes get shake milton in the starting lineup do that right now that just speaks to how good shake looks so i think that's a positive um i do think he's going to let it ride a little bit i think he wants to see how this looks for a little bit plus that bench unit just looks really good so do you want to sacrifice that bench unit looking good to 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 to, to, to jump start the starting unit because it's it's kind of like you're, it's kind of like a catch-22 thing with that in that regard so i would say I think Doc Rivers is going to ride this out for a little bit, but it's definitely not set in stone, and I could certainly see Shake Milton maybe forcing his way into the starting lineup at some point. He's Paul Hudrick, our 76ers insider for 97.3 ESPN.com. Follow him on Twitter at Paul Hudrick. Check out his latest key takeaways from the Sixers game at 97.3 ESPN.com, the 97.3 ESPN mobile app, and make sure you go subscribe and download the latest episode of Coming In for a Landing podcast that Paul hosts as all guests he appeared on the Boardwalk kind of hotline. Paul, appreciate the time and the information. Absolutely, guys. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays to you. Absolutely. Merry Christmas to you as well. Sports Bash being brought to you by Delaware Valley Acura Dealers for great dealers on Acura's award-winning lineup. Shop online at DelValAcuraDealers.com. He's Hunter Birdie. I'm Josh Hennig. 
Filling in for Mike Gale here on Christmas Eve on 97.3 ESPN FM and the 97.3 ESPN mobile app. It's free thanks to First Bank of Seattle City. Happy holidays to all of our listeners. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas from 97.3 ESPN. Great stuff there from Paul Hudrick, our 97.3 ESPN.com Sixers insider. It felt like to me he had similar concerns about Tobias Harris that you did. Oh, yeah. He might have been even more uh, harsher than I was, to be honest with you. I don't know. I was thinking, is it possible one day he's on the bench? Oh, wow. That would that would be a tough eyes or a little bit like ben, benching uh, Carson Wentz, right? Exactly. Benching your $180 million man. Well, Rudy Gobert's making $205 million, so I don't know if I feel that much better. But anyway, coming up, we have Eagles talk about, because as we mentioned about Carson Wentz, Eagles play the Cowboys this week. Another start for Jalen Hurts. What does that mean for the Eagles? The Eagles are still mathematically in it. We'll get into that as well as the NFL Week 16 slate with KC Jordan Football Scientist next on the Sports Bash with 97.3 ESPN FM and the 97.3 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Seattle City. Josh Hedick filling in for Mike Gale here on Christmas Eve on 97.3 ESPN alongside Hunter Brody here. We got just another 30 minutes left for you as we lead you up to Hawaii versus Houston at the bottom of the hour in the New Mexico Bowl. I mean, how confusing is that, Hunter? You have Hawaii versus Houston in the New Mexico Bowl. Sounds like a Josh kind of game. Oh, I'm, I'm all in for it, but I mean, it's just... I feel like I'm, like, covering too many locations in this bowl game here. I mean, you got Texas, you got Hawaii, and all of a sudden it's in New Mexico. Well, guess what? I'm excited for any sort of football, so I'm uh, I'm intrigued to hear it and, and watch it afterwards. Well, that's coming up next at the bottom of the hour here on 97.3 ESPN. But joining us right now on the Boardwalk kind of hotline, he agreed to join us a day early. Casey Joyner, the football scientist, one thought on every game. Get his perspective on as well on the Eagles versus the Cowboys. And as I'll guess, he joins us on the boardwalk kind of hotline. Casey, how are you doing this Thursday? Oh, doing great. How are you guys? Doing pretty good. And listen, you know, when you look at this game coming up for the Eagles, you know, they're still mathematically in it, which is amazing in and of itself. But the other thing is, is that it seemed like despite all the injuries, the 13th different offensive line, guys who worked at a tire store and playing in the secondary, this Eagles team still found a way to be competitive, and it feels like a lot of that is because of this rookie quarterback. It does. Uh, Hertz is, is allowing the offense to do so many things that they just weren't able to do under once. I mean, they, the, the, the trend today, obviously, is that you've got quarterbacks who can hit you in the rushing game and in the passing game. He can do that, but he's added the verticality into the game. I believe he had five uh, vertical completions last week, which is uh, a big plus for this offense, and he was able to get it to more receivers. He's able to not just hit one target. He's able to spread the ball around on vertical passes and that sort of thing. I mean, when you can do those things, when you can run the ball like he has and you get at the vertical passes, it just gives this offense a different type of a complexion that it had a couple weeks ago. You mentioned the verticality and things he can do. Is it that he is a better at doing those things in Wentz, or is it that he's in a better mental framework right now than Wentz? I think he's in a better, better mental framework, but he's also the quarterback who can work better behind the, the shaky offensive line. He's comfortable if he doesn't have a, a shaky offensive line. I've been saying about Wentz all year that one of the big things for him is that he has to have a certain level of stability around him, in my estimation, to be able to be as you know, to reach his top level of productivity. Whereas Hurts, you can give him less stability, and he's able to work around that. So I think that's a big factor. I also think, though, that because you've got the things that Hurts can do, it allows it allows Peterson to be able to go into the playbook and to, and to do different things in the playbook than he would otherwise. There are a few things I think Hurts can do in the vertical game just because you can get the defense to bite up on the, the you know his rushing ability. I think that opens up some doors in the passing game. So I think it's a combination of factors. That ties perfectly in the question I want to bring up next is what have you seen out of Jalen Rager since making the quarterback switch? I guess that kind of goes hand in hand with what you were saying with Dougie P and the playbook. Yeah, and I, I think that also I think. Uh, Let's put it this way. If you're Wentz, 
if you're taking chances at any point in the game, and, and mind you, he took plenty of really bad chances, but if you're taking chances, you know, hey, I don't have any. There's, I, they're gonna, not going to cut me any slack. People are expecting me to fail, and, and, and he would still take those chances, but you know that he was a little hesitant to do so. I think Hurts is – He's more willing to be maybe to take some chances and put some balls in the areas that you know I, I think he's more capable of doing so at this point. But he's also more willing to do so because he knows, hey, if I make a mistake, okay, look, I can make these other big plays, and I don't have this track record of a bunch of games where I've been making errors. So it allows him to be able to do that, and I think it allows Peterson to open the playbook and, and throw more passes to a guy like Rager to, to, to go for vertical passes in a way that he couldn't before because he knows, hey, if one mistake happens, well, we got a new quarterback and then comes some slack. Casey Joyner joining us here on the Boardwalk on the Hotline on 97.3 ESPN. Make sure you follow him on Twitter at Casey Joyner TFS for your NFL and fantasy football news and information. Casey, this week they got the Cowboys for the second time. No Ben DiNucci this time. It's Andy Dalton out there. But well, one thing is with the Cowboys is they have won two straight. The blowout win over the Burrowless Bengals and then a tough win last week without, without Ezekiel Elliott against the 49ers, so what are the Cowboys bringing into this game that the Eagles didn't see the first time round? Now, one thing is they've got a more, uh, much more dangerous offense. The Cowboys have racked up 30 more points in three of the past five games, and also their defense is is, is playing, playing a lot better because they have seven takeaways over the past two weeks. I think uh, that that's one of the, you know they were able to get takeaways last week because San Francisco just tends to make a lot of those risky plays. They're they're one of the worst turnover laden teams in the league, so that that's part of it. But I think they realize Dallas does that. The issues they have on defense are they don't have the type of power rushing game that they had a few years ago where that where they can control the game that way. They know that they've got to get into high-scoring games. They know that, that, that that's just going to be the you know, the way things are with them. So I think it's causing them to be more aggressive in the passing game. I think it's going to afford the Eagles some opportunities to make some interceptions. Now, you mentioned but, interceptions, Casey, but we know that Darius Slay is coming back. Do you have confidence in the rest of that secondary to hold up against Cooper, Gallup, and uh, and Lamb, considering the fact you just mentioned they're a high-powered offense, they're going against Michael Jaquette. Yeah, I, I'm thinking, yeah, and, and, and if you see more, and, and Robbie Coleman has been playing particularly well. Even Slay, I've got him. I use my color-coded rankings for defensive players. Red is great for from a defensive perspective. Yellow is okay, and green is bad. And Slay had been red for a long time, but I've dropped him down to yellow because he's just too inconsistent. I mean, the matchup would say that he might line up against Gallup. They may end up saying, okay, we're going to have him follow Cooper, which they probably should do because if you're putting uh, Jaquette or you're putting Seymour or anybody else on, on Cooper, you're just asking for problems. But I think all of these things are leaning toward. In fact, I also, by the way, downgraded the Eagles' uh, uh, safeties now. Mills and, and Epps, uh, I've got the list in the lineup, and they're both listed as green right now. So I think that if you're the Eagles, you've got to expect that Dallas might put up 30 points in this game as well. And if they do, you better be expected to go out there and try to put up 35. So I think it's going to be called for an aggressive game plan. How do you think that Doug Peterson can best utilize Miles Sanders on Sunday? <laughs> Hand him the ball as often yeah. as possible. <laughs> Give him 30 carries. Dallas, over the past five games, they've allowed 120 or more rushing yards to running backs alone. This is not counting quarterbacks. Running backs alone, they've allowed 120 or more rushing yards in four out of five games, and they've allowed six rushing touchdowns to running backs in that time span. And mind you, they were bad or even worse earlier in the year. This is a defense that gets out of position on defense. They don't hold their gaps well. They don't have gap respons- They don't hold the gap responsibilities well. You can also Move them out of a. You, know, you can move them there. They're not. A, they're, they don't have a stout enough defense. I mean, if I'm looking at the Eagles, I'm going. I want to do all types of running plays. I'd love to be able to see them do more than just zones. Though I don't want to see just the outside, the inside, and middle zones. Really like to see some trap plays. Really like to see some power rushing plays too. Because I think the combination of those factors could get them that. But they don't need to just give it to Sanders either. I think if they want to run the ball 30 times, they better be incorporating Boston Scott, who's got some of the best vision in the league. Casey, this year, the Eagles defense, they've been top five in sacks, top five in quarterback hits, top five in quarterback hurries, and they're doing it with basically just a defensive front. A lot of people in this area, they criticize Jim Schwartz a lot, and even though they had a lot of you know, yards yanked up against it, it was realistic. If it wasn't for a handful of five, what, four fabulous catches, two by Hopkins, one by Fitzgerald, and one by Arnold, they probably don't score as many points. So what is your perspective on this Eagles team and the job they've done the last few weeks? 
if you can get the pass rush with four, there's no need to keep bringing blitzes and things. You can go ahead and you go ahead and do that. That's what they ought to be doing. And frankly, I think they'll be able to get that kind of a pass rush. I mean, the Cowboys are going if they're going to be aggressive, you're going to go vertical. If you're going to go vertical, you got to block for three seconds, and you're going to afford the Eagles some opportunities. I think the Eagles need to be sitting back, though. I think the Eagles need to try to. You don't want to just give up the big play. I know it's an old cliche thing, but you got to make these guys dink and dunk their way down the field, and they've got the people to do that because really, I mean, Gallup has been a vertical receiver in past years, but he hasn't been that impactful of late. I don't think – I think Lamb is hitting the rookie wall a bit, so he's not going to be as impactful. So if I'm the Eagles, I'm saying, okay, I might be doing the old Bill Belichick cover one, double Cooper, and they, you know just, just have that simple defensive scheme and say, hey, this is what we're going to do because I just don't think that they, uh, they have to, too much – to worry about from the other Dallas players. Having said that, though, when you've got that many green rated players in your secondary, you're going to give up big plays, and it's 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 a tough thing for the Eagles because they don't have. I think they don't have the horses in their secondary to be more aggressive. Casey Jordan, one thought on every game here on ninety-seven-three ESPN. Let's get to all the schedule. We got Friday, Saturday, Sunday games to hit on with Casey right here on the Sports Bash on ninety-seven-three ESPN. Casey, tomorrow folks can hear. Vikings Saints right here on 97.3 ESPN FM. Will Drew Brees be better in his second start than the rough three quarters he had in the first one back? I think he could be, but uh, the problem for the Saints is that on defense, they've given up 420 of our rushing yards over the past two weeks, and they they rushed for a few of the 100 rushing yards in back-to-back games for the first time this season. So it's their ground game that's causing as much of a problem as anything. The Vikings have, get, have racked up 145 more rushing yards per game in line for three straight contests, scored 27 or more in four of the past five. So I'm actually picking this, uh, the Vikings tomorrow. Looking at Saturday, a triple header. The first game on the slate starting at 12:30 here on 97.3 ESPN. Bucks versus Detroit. Can the Bucks get to a four quarters game? It feels like they keep starting out slow, Casey. They do, and they can't keep affording to do that. But thing is, the Bucks offense last week it posted its third highest passing yardage total of the season. The Bucks defense lied its second lowest rushing yardage total. I think the Bucks are getting back to their early season success formula. The Lions, I mean, they won't even have their head coach there on the field, but he's been getting the most that he can have a talent challenge club. But the Lions have allowed 148 points over the past four games, so I just don't think they get a chance in this one. 49ers versus Cardinals. It seems like the 49ers are one of the most injured teams in all of football, but they still keep finding ways to compete. And the Cardinals, they need to keep winning to make sure they have a spot in the playoffs, Casey. They do, and their offense has stepped up after going through a slump for about five weeks there. The past two contests, 262 rushing yards, 654 passing yards, 48 first downs, 59 points. Their defense has been has tallied two or more takeaways in five of the past nine weeks. In San Francisco, 16 giveaways in the past five weeks and two or more giveaways in every game since week four. They're so error prone on picking the Cardinals. Miami Dolphins versus the Vegas Raiders. This Dolphins team was a big favorite for a while, but they've lost – Three of their last four, can they get a win versus the Raiders? Yeah, the Raiders, uh, they they were at 6-3 at one point. You figured they were going to be a legit playoff contender, but their defense has fallen apart. Over the past four games, they've allowed uh, 36 points per game, and they've allowed 400 or more offensive yards on eight occasions this year. Miami has given up fewer than 200 net passing yards for the past six contests, getting a lot of takeaways, too, and Las Vegas has 11 giveaways in the past four weeks. I'm speaking Miami. Sunday slate starting with the Falcons versus the Chiefs. It feels like this Chiefs team is just destined to run to the Super Bowl. Does Atlanta have any fight in this game? Uh, the, the Chiefs have some problems in their secondary. I don't think they're quite as strong in their secondary as uh, in their pass rush has been quite a fact. Their defense, I think, is a not quite an Achilles heel, but uh, they can, teams can get into shootouts with them. The problem is Atlanta's tied 17 or fewer points in three of the past five games. They're just not slated. To, they don't have the kind of powerhouse offense to get into that type of shootout, even with the, the talent that they have. So I'll take Kansas City. Jets coming off their first win of the season. They got Cleveland. Cleveland, they actually mathematically can still win the AFC North. <laughs> I think they actually probably will because I think uh, we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute, but Pittsburgh got its hands full this week, and then, then if Cleveland wins this game and Pittsburgh loses, then Cleveland and Pittsburgh will be for the AFC North title on Week 17. The Jets, uh, by the way, now after what they did last week, they scored 23 or more points in four of the past six games. So, I mean, they can uh, put up some points, but Cleveland's offense is playing so well, and last week they showed what they can do in certain games. They can get shut down defense, too, so I'll take uh, the Browns. 
You mentioned the Steelers. Steelers taking on the Colts. This Colts defense is really good. And Pittsburgh, it felt like on Monday, the only guy who cared to win was Minka Fitzpatrick. Yeah, they, uh, and, and maybe Benny Snell. I mean, they just the, the the Steelers look like an unmotivated team, which is amazing. They have no verticality whatsoever. Ben's Roethlisberger's arm is shot. They tallied fewer than 100 rushing yards in eight of the past nine games. They've given the ball away nine times in the past five games. They've racked up zero takeaways in two of the last three matchups. Key though, if they can get turnovers, the Colts are eight and one this year when they post zero or one giveaways in offense. So if the Steelers can get two, they get a chance. I don't think they'll get two. So I'm picking the Colts. Bears versus the Jags. The Bears, after their win last week, have put themselves in a position to still make the playoffs, or will the Jags steal their thunder? Uh, the Bears have rushed for 629 yards over the past four games, 368 yards over the past two weeks. Their ground game is doing fantastic. problem for them is that their defense has really taken a big step back. They've led 27 or more points and nearly 400 yards in three of the past four contests. Problem with Jacksonville, though, last four games they've given up 1,742 yards, and they've allowed fewer than 27 points twice all season. Their defense is that bad. I'll take Chicago. Giants are going into a game with more injuries, taking on the Ravens. The Ravens look like a hot team right now, and the Giants are look like a band of misfit toys. Yeah, they do. It looked like the Ravens were going to be out of playoff contention when they lost to Pittsburgh in that Wednesday afternoon game week 12, but they've run off three straight wins. They rushed for 684 yards and racked up 121 points in that span. I mean, the Giants, they tied 13 points in the past two weeks. They haven't posted 20 more points since week 10. Daniel Jones has hurt. Just so many elements going against them. I'm definitely taking Baltimore. Ryan Finley and the Cincinnati Bengals are going to Houston to take on the Sean Watson and the Texans. Why should we care? Yeah, exactly. What a scintillating game. Uh, I mean, the, we care. Maybe the Bengals will show up again like they did last week. They say they were saying, if I understand correctly, they are not saying who the quarter, starting quarterback is going to be. It might be Brandon Allen. It might be Finley. I mean, you know, which is like, okay, really? You think you're going to throw people off with that? But the Texans, they've been outscored 89-47 to 47 since that Thanksgiving Day one over Detroit. So that says that they've got problems. But the Bengals have scored a single-digit point total in three of the past four. Houston scored 20 or more in four of the past five, so I just think they've got more firepower. I'll take Houston. Casey Jordan, the football scientist, one thought on every game for NFL Week 16. Let's hit the 4 o'clock slate of games. The Broncos take on the Chargers. An interesting interdivisional matchup between two young quarterbacks. Yeah, definitely. It looked like I mean, when the Chargers lost to New England a few weeks ago, 45 nothing. you kind of figured, okay, they're, they're just going to fall apart for the rest of the year. But they've won two straight games, and frankly, it's the best two wins they've had all year. Denver started off 3-4, and four, but they've got a Swiss cheese rush defense, allowed 670 rushing yards in the past month. So even though they've won three straight against the Chargers, I think the Chargers are better suited to take this one. The Washington football team has Dwayne Haskins starting a quarterback despite everything that's happened this week because of the calf injury with Alex Smith, so can Washington beat Ron Rivera's former team, the Panthers? I think it's going to be very tough because, uh, I mean, last week they played well in defense, held Russell Wilson and company at 121 net passing yards, but they allowed four sacks and had their first game of two, two turnovers since week nine, so I think they're going to have that same problem with Haskins under center. Carolina's lost eight of its last nine games, but uh, you know, four of those defeats are by five or fewer points. I think it's going to be a really close game. I'm picking Washington barely because of the home field advantage. Won't surprise me for a second, though, if Carolina takes this one. Rams coming off of the embarrassing loss to the Jets, and now they got their divisional rival, Seattle. Could this game determine who wins the NFC West? It could. If Seattle wins it, they win the NFC West, and the Rams get a playoff berth if they win. I mean, Seattle, they were have letting Russell Wilson cook early in the year, and now of late they've decided, okay, we want to go back to that power-centric running game and then just go vertical as a counterpunch. Los Angeles has seen a decline in its passing productivity. They posted fewer than 200 net passing yards in three of their past four. They only got 189 yards in last week's epically embarrassing loss to the Jets. But the thing is, Seattle is intending to scale their passing game back, and the, the Rams are just not consistent. They don't want to be that team. So I'll take Seattle because they're just playing the kind of ball they want to play. Sunday football here on 97.3 ESPN Titans versus Packers. I think Aaron Rodgers should be the MVP this year, but this Packers defense, can they actually do anything to slow down the freight train known as Derrick Henry? 
I agree with you that Rodgers should be the MVP. And a lot of it is, you know, it's Rodgers versus Tannehill because Tannehill's getting some. He's getting a little push for, I don't know, if MVP, uh, he's not going to win that. But, you know, he's playing, he's playing of late. He's getting some consideration. But the point is this is a power, a matchup of heavyweight rushing attacks. Green Bay's posted 646 rushing yards in the past four weeks. But Tennessee's got 444 yards on the ground in the past two games alone, 150 more rushing yards than five of the past six contests. I just think that Green Bay's defense is less suited to stop Derrick Henry than the Titans are to stop Aaron Jones. And I think it's going to be the key to this contest who can stop the other team's running games. So I'll take Tennessee by a small margin. And, of course, Eagles versus Cowboys. Folks, you hear the coverage start at 3 o'clock here Sunday on 97.3 ESPN. Casey, your keys to the game and your pick for Eagles-Cowboys. Oh, the Eagles with Hurts under center, they posted back-to-back games with 400 or more offensive yards for only the first time this season. They tallied 24 more points in consecutive contests for the first time since week six. He's also fired up the defense as Eagles have posted five takeaways in that span. I mentioned that the Cowboys got their offense going, but they're turnover-laden too, so I think it's a high-scoring turnover-filled contest, but Hurts gives the Eagles enough of a big play edge. That I'll take, uh, I'll take uh, the Eagles in this one because of him. You heard Casey Joyner calls. He thinks the Eagles are going to beat the Cowboys, which means the Eagles can still mathematically be alive for the NFC East. Who would have thought how crazy this year has been? Make sure you give Casey a follow at Casey Joyner TFS for all your NFL and fantasy football analysis. I know people are still in their semifinals and championships this weekend. As all guests, Casey appeared on the boardwalk on the hotline. Casey, thanks so much for coming on the Thursday, and Merry Christmas, my friend. Hey, Merry Christmas. You guys, too. Appreciate it. Josh Hennig filling in for Mike Gill here on 97.3 ESPN. I want to remind you about my friends over at weightliftinghq.com. Of course, you can get that 10% off with Radio 10 off of anything in the store, whether your goals are to lose weight in 2021 or to up your workout program or maybe just build a whole new at-home gym. Weightliftinghq.com is everything you need from squat racks, bench racks, bench racks, kettlebells, dumbbells, resistance bands, and more. Everything you need to make your 2021 better than 2020 is at weightliftinghq.com. Again, the code is Radio 10 at checkout at weightliftinghq.com. Of course, a couple minutes left here in the show, Broads. We got football coming up at the bottom of the hour. Houston versus Hawaii. Can't wait. Can't wait to check in on all the action. I, I got some family dinner to go to tonight but i have a little bit of time after this show before i have to make a run over there and you know what i'm gonna pop on of course we're gonna put on the 97.3 espn app and listen now the interesting thing is is that did you notice that the schedule is very light today when it comes to sports and it's very heavy tomorrow i did notice that today's a little bit weaker compared to tomorrow and Josh, you also have Saturday, Sunday, a little back-to-back Sixers on top of Eagles, which is 425 on Sunday. So you you got a lot this weekend in terms of Philadelphia sports. Now, on Saturday, how are you going to make that work? Because I know the Sixers are later in the day. You have NFL earlier in the day. You know, what, what, what is what is a Hunter Brody game plan for Friday and Saturday with all these sports everywhere? Well, luckily, here in my man cave, I have the three TV setup, so there's going to be no shortage of of action. I'll tell you that for free, Josh. I'll have it all rocking and rolling. This is great, though, because I love the—it's not an excuse. It's a reality. I love saying I have work. I got to go in the manscape uh, in the uh, in the uh, man cave, hon. I got work, you know? Gil told me that would only last for so long. Well, guess what? It's still working. I think you just have a good woman. That's what I think it really is. She definitely is fully aware of my job and uh, the work ethic. So how about that? We'll just go with that. All right, bros. Before we get out of here, uh, we won't hear from you again until Sunday with Billy Schwime. So thoughts on the Eagles-Cowboys game? I think they're going to win, Josh. I really do. And and I have this feeling that everything's going to work out in their favor. What we need to happen in Washington, What what's that? We need Carolina to come out victorious, correct? Yep. We need the New York Giants to lose, correct? Which is probably kind of likely at this point. Going up against the Ravens. So, I feel Eagles win, Giants lose, Washington loses, and then week 17, here we are in the spot for a playoff. Again, next time you hear from Hunter Brody, aside from Sports Talk with Broads and his reactions after the Sixers games at 97.3 ES McCom is on Sunday with Billy Schwime. You'll be back with me on Monday to recap the Eagles game on Sunday here on the Sports Bash.
Yes, I will, and I can't wait. Hunter, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you and everybody listening. I'm Josh Hennig. Thanks, everybody, for listening today on the Sports Bash. Follow Broads on Twitter at Broads81. I'm at Josh Hennig on Twitter. Coming up next, we got college football. Big day tomorrow. Sports Bash, State of the Teams. Frank Close, Kevin Durso, Paul Hudrick, Jeff Mosher with Mike Gill covering all the teams on the Sports Bash tomorrow.